When we talk about architecture, we always think about nice things, right? Design, arts, creativity. Even at university, we're only exposed to the bright side. But it took me only one single project to realize that in the commercial and show-off way that it is practiced right now, architecture is a dirty job. And somebody has got to stop doing it. It's not because my first client molested my design, which seems to happen frequently to young architects, but mainly because I discovered that he has four other houses within a radius of 35 kilometers, which raised many questions in my mind, like why on earth is he still building? Did I improve the site by changing it from a natural environment into a built one for a very limited number of people to use it only two months a year? Did I not degrade other places on earth where the materials were extracted from? Realizing that less people have more houses and more people have less houses, one question kept coming back. If you have the means, does it mean you have the right? So I looked around me to see what the others are doing, and I found that everybody else is enjoying the ride of the construction wave, building and selling, building and selling, no questions asked. Nothing about the purpose or the market needs or the location, whether in riverbeds, mountain crest, or waterfront. Actually, the more environmentally sensitive the place is, the more it is solicited. And if you actually create a syndicate for developers in Lebanon, the whole country would be in it. From the bankers to the $1 investors, including the doctors, lawyers, barbers, and taxi drivers. And their main ideal target is the very limit 1% rich faction of the society. So no wonder why, in less than 100 years' time, this turned into that. I know it's hard to tell the difference, right? It used to take us two to three hours from Junia to Beirut. It still does. <laughs> we didn't have proper infrastructure back then. We still don't. But let's take a closer look at the invisible striking facts. We didn't use to have developers and architects. Actually, I still wish, I wish we still don't. We used to build with local materials rather than imported materials. We used to build with modest means instead of high destructive technology. But most importantly, we used to build to live in, out of need and not to live from and out of greed. But why did this happen? If you ask around you, you get to hear lots of excuses. How did we end up with this shift? You get to hear lots of excuses like overpopulation. But I ask you, if we convert the entire downtown into a huge park, would that increase the number of homeless people in Lebanon? How about Converting the waterfront, our overbuilt waterfront, into natural beach, would that not improve the quality of life of the entire Lebanese population? <laughs> or even the whole area of Fa'ra. If we convert it to, to, to a forest ski resort, would that not give a larger accessibility to tourists without increasing the number of homeless people? You may hear other excuses, right? Like war, lack of regulations, corruption. But the most absurd of all comes actually from the architects. If you don't do it yourself, someone else will do it. A very convincing answer. But to me, it's the same shift, different architects. <laughs> so I decided to dig further into that shift to understand really what is the real driver. And I was able to identify what could be called the Lebanese dream. If I give you one million dollars, what would you do with it? I don't have a million dollars, but supposedly. Most of the Lebanese share the same dream. The first million dollars goes for an apartment in the city and an SUV. The second million dollars, they would build a house in the mountain. 
Thank you. The third million dollar for a chalet in some ski resort and the fourth million dollar for a chalet at the beach, right? How about the fifth million dollar? Anyone, any idea? For a larger apartment in the city and a larger mountain house and larger chalet at the beach, right? The architect's common dream, on the other hand, is for a wealthy client to walk in, wanting to spend a huge amount of money on a huge project, for them to unleash their creativity and strike a pose on the cover of a magazine. <laughs> the thing is, the cruel reality, actually, is that some of these individual dreams is becoming our collective nightmare. So with such a collective nightmare, I felt the need to convert into something more purposeful. It's just like the slow food movement is a reaction to the fast, unhealthy movement, right? So as, an arch as a converted architect, the first thing I do when a client walks in, instead of jumping up and down in my seat, I try to convince him not to build. While ecological architecture is mainly about the means, which makes it a bit subject to greenwashing and commercialized product, I try to keep the focus on the very purpose of the project and making sure that the project is a response to a need, ideally to the largest number of people, cost efficient in order to achieve savings and a better distribution of wealth, and sustainable to reduce the impact on the environment. Only then, can creativity come into play? In an ideal world, a converted architect or such an approach for architecture should be compensated three times the current architecture. One from the client for saving him money by not building, one from the government for saving, saving the environment further degradation, and one from a representative of future generation for leaving them some natural resources to survive on. But in the real world, we found ourselves turning down more projects than taking. So when we decided to move offices, it was a great opportunity for us to save and rescue an old building and put the money where our mouth is. That's an expression, don't take me literally. So we did the first design that integrated most of the green technologies in terms of energy savings, uh, waste reduction, water management, material selection, and so forth. But we also tried to increase the total area by an additional 40%, which had an impact on the structure and the elevation, and that's the result. As our philosophy evolved, we wanted to achieve more savings, so we did a completely different design. This time, we didn't increase the areas. We simply focused on maximizing the use of the, very, of the existing spaces. We tried to focus on making the spaces flexible in order to accommodate different activities. For example, we can turn our offices from a working space to a reception area or an exhibition gallery, or even refurnish it back to how it was an apartment, as an apartment. We're still trying to work on uh, cabaret. <laughs> we eliminated all fixed furniture in favor for small pieces that are lighter and easier to move. So for example, the boxes here have now three functions. First, they, are, they were recycled, they were upcycled from a large furniture and now they have three functions, a bookshelf, a table, a chair, and an art display. Instead of saying, pull a chair, we say, grab the organic book box and sit on it, <laughs> literally. We applied the same approach on some elements of the building, like the columns that you just saw. They not only support the stair, but they also store the rainwater, and they exhibit artworks. Three keywords kind of dictated our converted design. Compact, flexible, and multifunctional, and efficient. 
Think of your smartphones. All the accessories that you previously needed to carry with you, like camera, watch, phone, flashlight, are now combined in one compact device. Converted architecture thinks of space in the same way. It allows for different activities to happen at different times of the day in one single space, rather than dedicating a different space for each activity. Often people think of technology, uh, green technologies as being expensive. The same technologies, if reduced and applied on a single multifunctional space, they become very economical. That's exactly what converted architecture is about. Between the two proposals, we were able to rescue a building in four months instead of two years, with a reduction in, cost, in the construction cost by five times, using, saving 85% of the materials and serving the same number of people. Now, conveying such an approach amongst, you know, faces less resistance among students with fresh minds. It builds more enemies with my colleagues and ex-classmates. So I went back to the university to teach, and I asked my students to apply the same methodology on one of their previous designs. Again, the results were systematically positive. A minimum of 25% reduction in the construction cost and an additional 40% in the green areas. <laughs> on a larger scale, I participated with two other advisors and a group of students to show the potential of Beirut to become sustainable and self-sufficient if it were to apply the smart city model and convert its approach. At the end of the workshop, we were able to imagine a way for Beirut to restore its identity as a port and beach city. The roads that, and highways that are supposed to connect the city are the very same reason for fragmenting it and disconnecting it from its harbor, its waterfront, and its river. By changing the way these highways cross the city to overlay with an existing railway line or go over or under green spaces, we were able to re-establish these connections. And then we moved on to make the city more resilient, again adopting the same methodological approach. A compact city where we can combine all compatible activities together, like in the dump site, to recycle the waste next to the creative industries to the south of it. Also making the city multifunctional, mainly for public spaces, like the green open spaces that we restored, not only provide for leisure activities, but they also reduce the problem of pollution, whether the air or um, by integrating wetlands at the estuary for the water treatment, or even cover the waste dump with a park. And finally, an improved efficiency when it comes to using the local resources. Around the river, we imagined urban farming greenhouses that not only provide the city with food, but also uh, generate clean energy. Now, clearly, in the way we dream, plan, and build our spaces, it is not sustainable. It's only a matter of time before everything collapses on the individual level, as well as on the collective level, unless we convert to a new purposeful approach. What's interesting about the conversion concept is that anyone can apply it in his own field and make profit while preserving the planet and contributing to the people's welfare. Thank you.